Coming up on Market to Market. With California locked in its third consecutive year of drought, the battle intensifies over water rights. And Midwestern entrepreneurs work to move power generated by the wind from the prairie to the people. Those stories and market analysis with Virgil Robinson, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, May 30 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Popular meat processor Hillshire Brands is at the center of a barnyard brawl. On Thursday, Tyson Foods, America's largest meat vendor, offered $6.2 billion for Hillshire. Tyson's bid topped a similar offer made two days earlier by rival poultry producer Pilgrim's Pride. The takeover bids for Hillshire by two major meat processors are being driven largely by a desire to own the company's brand name products like Jimmy Dean breakfast sandwiches. The convenience foods are more profitable than meat like beef and pork and poultry as profit margins decline, primarily due to persistent drought. Nowhere is that more apparent than in California, where a war is being waged over water. During a similar drought in the 70s, officials called for the Golden State's archaic water policies to be reformed. Forty years later, however, the reforms still have not been implemented. With California locked in its third consecutive year of extreme drought, the issue of water rights is also heating up. Some farmers, however, receive as much water as they want through an antiquated system of water allocations that was initially adopted in the 1800s. In a good year, we wouldn't be able to stand here unless we got wet. Because this right Al Monta is watching his 1,800 acres turn to dust this year because he does not have what are called senior water rights. A few miles away, however, other rice fields are flush with water because those growers get priority during a drought. That's because their rights date back to an era when the only claim was done through a notice nailed to a nearby tree. And the arcane laws leave the have-nots in a precarious position. That's going to impact every small community, large and small community in, the, in Northern California because we're an agricultural-based economy. Farm workers who depend heavily on the reliable source of water fear their livelihoods also are threatened without policy reforms. And major metropolitan areas further complicate the discussion. San Francisco, the state's fourth largest city, gets all the water it wants because of a claim made more than a century ago. The system seems cumbersome to a lot of people, it certainly is. It certainly works for San Francisco. Another concern is who is using water? And the question of accountability was raised by an Associated Press report this week. The article revealed 4,000 companies, farms, and landowners with grandfathered rights use trillions of gallons of water annually. That group holds more than half of the claims in California. According to the AP, the right system relies on self-reporting, and many records are fraught with errors and years out of date. So officials really don't know if rights holders are overdrawing or wasting the precious resource. The established rights holders are exempt from drought-related cuts in water allotments this year, despite the fact they are, by far, the biggest consumers. Conservation experts say that water policy needs to change. Because we're going to see a lot of suffering and a lot of uh, extra legal bills all over the place because we haven't done a particularly good job of quantifying our water rights. With the epic drought showing no signs of letting up anytime soon, more California fields are destined to turn to dust unless policy changes. But some growers feel the answer lies less in the demand side of the equation and more on the supply side. We have to be very diligent about 
developing more water resources in California. The EPA is poised to release new rules limiting carbon dioxide pollution from coal-fired power plants on Monday. But wind energy advocates announced this week that their industry is already reducing greenhouse gas emissions dramatically. A report published by the American Wind Energy Association revealed that the amount of wind energy produced in America last year reduced CO2 emissions by 126 million tons. That's the equivalent of taking 20 million cars off the road. But energy production is only the first step in the long and winding road to your light switch. And wind power, like electricity produced by other technologies, relies heavily on infrastructure to move the energy from the generator to the consumer. In the Midwest, entrepreneurs are trying to build new transmission lines to move wind power from the prairie to the people. Paul Yeager explains. The Midwest has long been recognized as an agricultural powerhouse. Fertile soils, favorable climate, and productive farmers have yielded unparalleled abundance. High above the grain belt, however, there's another resource that, so far, has largely been untapped, a massive tunnel of wind. Tapping into the relatively unused resource is a significant challenge for the wind energy industry, because the places best suited for wind turbines are located in some of the least populated parts of the nation. A massive investment in infrastructure will be required to move that power from rural farms to lucrative urban markets hundreds of miles away. Promising to invest $2 billion over the next five to seven years in Iowa and Illinois, Clean Line Partners, a private company, has placed a major bet on wind power. The company isn't planning on harnessing the energy, but rather moving it to major population centers with a project it calls the Rock Island Clean Line. In 2012, about 25% of the power that we used came from wind energy, so it's better than any other state in the nation. Uh, what we also know is we have an abundant, uh, an abundant resource. So whether it be wind or solar or hydro, um, those resources don't exist. And so therein lies the market that we can deliver this renewable power from Northwest Iowa into that market, uh, where we know that they have a pretty strong demand for it. Fueled by Arctic air from the north, this seemingly limitless supply of wind stretches across the plains and corn belt down to the deep south. At 260 feet above the ground, wind speeds in this Midwestern corridor average more than 20 miles per hour, more than twice their average pace elsewhere in America. And that's why wind turbines are becoming as common as corn stalks in the heartland, and companies like Clean Line Partners want to invest in the electrical highways that will move the renewable resource. Iowa and Illinois would require a 500 mile high voltage line to connect to a substation near Chicago. From there, the energy would be distributed all the way to the eastern seaboard. But the transmission lines, like traditional farm to market roads, require land to be leased or bought and in some cases even forcibly taken from private landowners. I am for responsible use of wind energy that does not include the use of eminent domain. Greenfield, Iowa farmer Carolyn Sheridan founded the Preservation of Rural Iowa Alliance, an advocacy group whose members oppose high voltage transmission towers in their backyards. The Alliance, a loose affiliation of landowners along the clean line route, has enlisted some influential allies. The monetary benefits of any company, any county, or any person should never trump private property rights. Um, so State Representative Bobby Kaufman of Wilton, Iowa, drafted a bill to protect property owners. The measure was written to make it harder for Clean Line Partners to use eminent domain when landowners and the company can't agree on a price. The intent of this bill on this subcommittee is about those who do not want your compensation packet, regardless of how great it is. This bill that I'm crafting has nothing to do with being against wind energy. Uh, what my bill does, it just gives a voice to landowners who are attempting to be steamrolled by, to be frank, a couple of billionaires down in Texas. But where the problem lies in is that there are hundreds of landowners who do not want this. There are hundreds of landowners that don't want 150-foot-tall structures stuck on their farm without their consent, regardless of how much money they're offered. 
And so the intent of my bill is to give a voice to landowners who do not want part of their property condemned. And my bill then is forcing this company to choose a route where you've got the most people that are agreeable. Despite that assessment of landowners' motivation to sell or the lack thereof, the measure Kaufman proposed in the Iowa legislature never made it to the House floor for a vote. Many of the iconic turbines sprouting up across the Midwest and South are capable of generating between 1.5 and 3 megawatts of output annually. According to the American Wind Energy Association, a single 1 megawatt wind turbine generates enough electricity to power 240 to 400 households. Over the last three decades, wind energy has gone from making up less than 1% of the national electrical energy mix to 4% in 2013. The largest amount of growth occurred during the past 15 years when a 170% increase in annual capacity was spurred by the federal wind energy tax credit. In addition to environmental concerns and energy security, the development of wind power in America is highly influenced by Uncle Sam. The federal government has subsidized development by offering a corporate tax credit of 2.3 cents per kilowatt hour generated, while state level policymakers have provided guaranteed markets through renewable energy portfolios. The first renewable energy portfolio was enacted in Iowa in 1983 when Governor Terry Branstad signed the first renewable energy mandate. Branstad believed putting turbines in Iowa fields would help farmers earn some much needed income. Since then, the idea of renewable energy portfolios has been copied in other states across the country. And in 2006, President George W. Bush called for wind power to make up 20% of the nation's renewable energy portfolio by 2030. But it will take more than building turbines in the Midwest to make sure that energy will reach the nation's cities and suburbs. The monumental task will require new transmission lines traversing fertile fields in Iowa and Illinois. And farmers will have to decide if they will accept the payments offered by clean line partners or prepare to fight it out in court. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. Next, the Market to Market Report. There's an old adage on Wall Street to sell in May and go away. But after the S&P 500 settled Friday at its fifth record high in the last six sessions, some investors are wondering if they should change their tune in June. Grain prices, on the other hand, continued their pullback from contract highs. For the week, July wheat lost 25 cents, while the nearby corn contract moved 12 cents lower. Old crop soybeans gave back half of last week's rally as the July contract declined by 22 cents. The nearby meal contract followed suit with a loss of $2.40 per ton. In the softs, cotton was virtually unchanged as the July contract declined by less than a nickel per hundredweight. In the dairy market, June Class 3 milk lost 14 cents, while the deferred contract gained 13 cents. It was another wild week in livestock, where the August cattle contract gained nearly $1.50, August feeders traded in record territory and route to a weekly gain of $4.20, but the July lean hog contract continued its decline with a weekly loss of $3.25. In the financials, the euro was virtually unchanged against the dollar. Crude oil lost $1.64 per barrel. Comex Gold declined by nearly $46 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index lost nearly 10 points to settle at $649.55. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Virgil Robinson. Virgil, welcome back. Hello, Mike. Nice to be with you. Well, let's <clears> jump <throat> into the wheat market. As we take a look at it this week, we've continued to see it slide. Are we just again, overwhelmed with global supply? Is that what's pushing us lower? Well, I think that's been one of the problems, Mike. And in each of the last couple of weeks, there have been wheat originations at values well below U.S. origination. So clearly that competitive factor is, is illustrated in that regard. Um, Interestingly, the International Grain Council just this week actually reduced global wheat production month over month 
by I think three or four million metric tons, but more importantly, uh, reduced it by about 15 million metric tons year over year. But given that, the exporting countries uh, that produce wheat, Mike, have good prospects at present, and the concerns and the issues that developed here in the U.S. have become secondary. The issues primarily the drought, the winter kill, and the hard red winter side, that's what's sort of become secondary. Yeah, it's difficult, I think, to visit with you know a, a wheat grower in Texas, Oklahoma, or Kansas uh, who's trying to decide, do I go to the effort of harvesting this crop, what little there is of it, and seeing on a weekly basis, or now a monthly basis, a decline of well over a dollar a bushel. Uh, but again, that helps explain and illustrate the globalization of these markets. That's the truth. And as we look at the globalization, and particularly in the wheat market, as we look at this uh, shrunken, perhaps, global production number. Is there the opportunity for the demand side to pick back up and, and maybe provide some, some selling opportunities through the remainder of spring into summer? Well, it would be unusual if we were to go through an entire season without some type of weather concern, whether it's perceived or real. Um, I would think, given the fact that we've discounted wheat prices as rapidly and as abruptly as we have, There'll be some opportunities, Mike. I can't guarantee they'll start Monday morning. But soft red wheat, um, the cash index, I looked at it this afternoon, just a tick above $6. And we haven't been there for many, many months. So if there is procurement or are buyers that are in need, we've clearly given them a wonderful opportunity. All right. Well, now let's take a look over at the corn side. And again, you mentioned weather problems, probably going to be a factor. On corn, we've seen most of it get in the ground. We've seen sort of the, the first weather issue go into the rearview mirror. Is this sell-off then just traders relaxing after we finally got the crop in the ground? I, I think certainly that's a portion of it. But we need to note that as of late, um, cargoes of corn originating in Brazil and Argentina have dropped to a level where they are at or beneath U.S. values. So they're again illustrating the competitive element that has developed in these markets and will continue for the foreseeable future. Uh, you mentioned corn futures down, I think, 12 or 13 cents on the week cash values, at least the way I track them, only down about 7 or 8 cents. So that tells us then the basis, which in my mind is one of the real good indicators of demand, really hasn't diminished, but rather has in fact gotten stronger. Um, you know, all of the liquidation in, in commodity futures, there are a whole bunch of reasons for that, but one that I can identify with is about 10 days or two weeks ago, a major lending institution on the East Coast downgraded and in fact suggested, at least in my interpretation, eliminating commodities, many of them agricultural, from their asset base. And certainly I think that has led to some significant liquidation from the, quote, speculative community. Certainly. Um, so again, you know, I'm seeing some things in the cash market that actually suggest demand has strengthened, which is completely at odds with the behavior of futures. So I think there'll be a reconciliation here in the not too distant future. Um, we'll take a look at crop progress on Monday as well as the first crop rating. I think the crop rating will be relatively good, Mike, but probably already accounted for in the futures market. I think the market's near an area of, of price stability and likely to create some type of futures recovery. So if you're still lugging old crop corn, and I made this statement a week ago, I still think there'll be a better opportunity to move that inventory than we have at tonight's marketplace. All right. Now, you mentioned the cash market. As we touch touch on basis in particular, we've got a question from Calvin. He's one of our viewers who, who tweeted to us at the Market to Market account. And... Uh, He's curious about the ethanol market in particular. We've seen very strong ethanol mar uh, mm -hmm. margins for the last two months. And so he's curious what's on the horizon for the ethanol market. Well, we'll have some policy um, statements in the very near future, Mike. So in lieu of that, I'll be careful here how I respond to that, to that question. Um, 
ethanol is still the oxygenate of choice in terms of blending. Um, and I, I don't think that will change until there are alternatives or substitutes that are equally as good or less expensive. I don't see that in the near future. Uh, he mentioned that ethanol margins are strong, and that's true. Uh, the demand for distillers remains quite strong and likely to remain strong with $500 soybean meal at hand. So, you know, again, I think the ethanol processors have increased and strengthened their local basis, and I'll allude to that one more time, by as much as five to 10 cents a bushel just this week. So clearly, if your market pulls include an ethanol plant or two and you have old crop grain that you would like to sell, they are a very good candidate to make that sale with. Makes it enticing here in the near term and then longer term, we'll have to wait and see what comes out of Washington, D.C. I think policy is a big factor here moving forward, Mike. All right. Well, now let's take a look over at the soybean market. Uh, again, a down week in beans, both old crop and new crop. As we look at the, on the old crop side, uh, we do have notoriously tight situation in America. Is that beginning to uh, ameliorate at all with, with southern uh, South American bean importation at all? Well, we had a couple of ships arrive this week, one in North Carolina, one in Virginia, and assumedly there are more to follow. Uh, could be upwards or near 90 million bushel of imports from the Southern Hemisphere. Now, I'm a little skeptical of that, Mike, but nonetheless, that is kind of common knowledge in the marketplace. Um, old crop dynamics, in my mind, have not changed significantly because processing margins remain attractive. We've not seen any consistency in terms of cancellations from the Chinese and or other buyers. Cumulative sales to this point in the calendar are in excess of what the Department of Agriculture is forecasting for a yearly export number. So clearly they have the opportunity June 11th to adjust that number, and I think probably will. Now, the one thing that, that, that remains kind of a headwind here is the notion, and it will require yet additional time to verify this, is that last year's soybean crop was underestimated. Okay, now that's possible, Mike, that's certainly possible, but certainly I don't know that. And as mentioned, we'll not verify that for weeks. But to this point, I still think there is risk in terms of old crop soybean prices moving higher. Um, if I had a relatively manageable amount of old crop beans in hand, I'd continue to own those at least for the next few weeks. All right. Last year in kind of similar circumstances, and I think this is the correct date, the uh, cash index, I think, made its high, old crop bean price high, on July 21st or 22nd. Now, I'm not saying that's a, a date of reconciliation, but I still think there's dynamics in that old crop soybean market, and I clearly would not be short bought that contract or that old crop, new crop spread. All right, speaking of the new crop spread, do you see this new crop improving? In, in terms price? of price? Yes. Mike, it's conceivable here that the inversion just continues to grow as it did last year, as we headed through the month of June into July. I think it, the inversion got to $3.50. New crop soybeans, um, you know, if all these acres come to fruition, and they do in fact, um, yield at what's commonly being used as a factor tonight will have an excess of new crop beans one year from now. So I still like the idea of some type of put strategy or if these prices meet your, your marketing goal objectives, certainly a sale of some increment would be appropriate. All right. Well, let's take a look at the mm. livestock market. We saw the, uh, the fat cattle prices continue to pull up this week. Are we seeing some stability in, in the fat cattle marketing, do you think? Well, I'm not sure I know how to address stability in any of these markets. Uh, but there's been some convergence between price of cash and the June futures contract, and to a lesser degree, the August. Um, it's common knowledge, I think, that if the recent cattle and feed reports are accurate, we'll see an increase in show lists beginning quite soon. So that would suggest then an increase in available product. Now to that issue, and again, it's hard to track demand, but export sales remain relatively brisk and solid. 
Uh, I did see the restaurant performance index for the month of April, again above 100, which is kind of an indicator of total meat demand from that sector hasn't wavered. So demand remains strong, and, and I think we'll sustain this 135 to 140 dollar price level. Uh, live price level, Mike, for the next several weeks. That would be my opinion. All right. Now, as we look at the feeder cattle market, we don't have much time left, but we had a big move this week. Have we peaked out, do you think, looking at the trends in the market? Well, I'm not convinced we've peaked out. Picking tops is a dangerous business. Um, but the feeder cattle market, you know, a couple things. Feed costs have come down significantly. There's been some modest improvement in pasture and range conditions in select areas of the country. And those deferred cattle futures are quite attractive. So the sum of those things suggests to me um, that feeder prices are going to remain strong moving forward, Mike. Whether we can sustain this for in you know a, a significant length of time remains to be seen. There'll be a change at some point, but I don't sense it at the present. All right. Well, Virgil, thanks for being with us tonight. We will uh, pick up the hog market story in the Market Plus segment online. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Virgil and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in our Market Plus segment online. You'll also find audio podcasts and streaming video of, of our program, as well as links to our Twitter feed, Facebook page, and the rest of our social media outlets exclusively at that Market to Market website. And be sure to join us next week when Missouri cattle producers will explain how the Show Me State's Heifer Improvement Program is paying off. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company, offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.